stepping outside your field of competence. This is in some ways a follow-up video to one I posted earlier about the difficulties I have understanding modern physics in the areas of general relativity, for example, and quantum theory. How physics in particular, as a scientific discipline, has gone beyond the capacity of ordinary folks like me to really understand what they're saying. Now, since I posted that, I've done a lot more watching of videos on these topics. And in particular, videos of scientists actually arguing about some of these issues. And I guess having watched that, I don't feel quite so bad about my own incompetence and ignorance in this area. Because it became clear to me that many physicists, for example, don't fully understand the theories that some other field of physics is exploring or that some other physicist is proposing. And one example of that was a, a very well known, look, I can't remember the name, and if I did, I probably wouldn't say it. One particularly successful, well known physicist who was saying that he simply didn't have time to read all of the theories that came across his desk, because particularly they were highly mathematical, as I also mentioned in my previous video. And it would actually take months to go through this dense mathematics. He was saying that he would almost have to learn the language of this particular field in order to understand what the paper was saying, but then he'd have to plow through it in detail to try and see whether it all held together. And that could actually take months when you have 40 pages of dense calculations. So even a physicist at the top of his game has to admit that he can't really understand or even evaluate the theories of others. He simply doesn't have time. And although he didn't say it, he may not have the competence to do so either. So there is clearly a danger in physics that it becomes very narrow. In all areas of science, when you reach the PhD stage, your area of research becomes extremely narrow and you focus on some very specific issues and some very specific questions and you don't necessarily know much of anything about anything else. You become an expert in that field and anything out that's outside that field you have maybe some more competence than the average layperson might have, but not enough to really comment sensibly on what other areas of science are saying, even within one discipline of science, say physics or biology or chemistry, because your field of research becomes very narrow. You're an expert in that. You understand what you're saying. A handful of your postdoctorates and doctoral students around you understand what you're saying, and maybe one or two physicists over there in some other university understand what you're saying. The rest of us, us, have to make our best guess. Of course, one of the ways that scientists try to communicate their ideas, and in a, in a sense it's incumbent upon them to do so, is to actually simplify them and try to explain them in simple language so that us numbskulls can actually understand. And to do that, you use lots of metaphorical language, an analogies, the kind of thing that I was talking about in the last video. To communicate science to a lay audience, you basically have to let's be honest, dumb it down and put it in terms that are comprehensible. But it's always important that they and we never mistake those analogies, those metaphors for the real thing. They are only that. They are only an analogies. They are only metaphors. Nevertheless, I find that even advanced physicists do need some kind of metaphor even for themselves to understand what they're doing. Hence you get, for example, string theory. Now string is clearly a metaphor. It's not meant to be taken literally, but it's a kind of visualization of what is being explained by these very complex equations. So even they are not completely free of this need to visualize, to provide metaphor for something that they're working on. But in watching scientists debate certain issues, particularly in the fields of quantum theory and general relativity, it's very clear that there's a broad range of disagreement, particularly the quantum theory area, I think. There's an enormous range of disagreement about what quantum theory actually is described, whether it's actually right or not. 
It seems fairly clear to me that some elements of it are, if not wrong, they're certainly incomplete. And you would certainly expect any scientific theory to be incomplete, I think. But how to progress quantum theory, how to move it forward, there's very little agreement, it seems to me, about that. Some people are much more vocal in that area than others. They catch the imagination of people like you and me out there in the lay person's realm. So it's like any area of human communication and perhaps exacerbated even more that I live in my world inside my own body, inside my own head, with my own experiences, my own ideas, and you are out there in your body, inside your head, with your experiences and your ideas, and communicating is very difficult. When I say something that I understand in a particular way, you could easily hear it in a different way, and vice versa. And that's, I suspect, even more so when you come to these very complicated, convoluted ideas of physics. But one of the other things that becomes apparent watching physicists and other scientists discuss their theories in public is that they often cross the line between what is pure science into speculation and philosophy. And they do so, I suspect, without recognizing that they're doing it, certainly without acknowledging that they're doing it. Now, I think when they do that, they're actually stepping out of their area of expertise. And this is something that people do all the time. And we sometimes encourage people to do this. But when a physicist begins to philosophize, for example, about the multiverse, it's fairly clear to me, watching and listening to one particular scientist talk about the multiverse, that the idea he was expressing was not science. This was philosophy, perhaps even fantasy. The idea clearly appealed to him, and he tries to cover it up in scientific terminology, but there was really nothing scientific about what he was saying. But because he's a well-known scientist, and we appreciate the enormous intellect that this person must have, then we assume that what they're saying outside their area of expertise has as much validity as what they're saying from within their area of expertise. And this is certainly not the case. An area that I often think about myself is the interface between philosophy and theology on the one hand and science on the other hand. And whenever I see a, a scientist, whether it be a physicist or a biologist, critiquing religion and making statements about theology and philosophy, I always cringe just a little because I don't think they necessarily have the exp expertise that they need to critique religion, for example. They think they do, and I think that's the danger of having a little knowledge, is that you think you have more knowledge than you actually do. So they think they understand what they're critiquing, but I don't think that they necessarily do, certainly not in the way that someone trained in that other discipline understands it. So some of their criticisms from the point of view of science towards religion say, while I appreciate the spirit of what they're doing, and I would really like to be cheering them on, sometimes I cringe because I think they're misunderstanding or misrepresenting what they're critiquing. I think none of us really expect someone trained in theology to understand the intricacies of biology or particle physics or whatever it might be. And yet we seem to think that someone trained in an area of physics or biology should be able to understand the intricacies of philosophy and theology. Now, I will admit that some forms of theology in the world today are very simplistic, very naive. They're little more than fairy tales, let's be honest. But there is a deep vein of theology that is rooted in philosophy and is exploring ideas that are much deeper, more subtle, more intricate level than popular theology is. You can, you can criticize popular theology and popular religious beliefs, but in doing so, you don't really touch that deeper vein of theology and philosophy that is centuries old. And to understand that, you really have to study as hard for that as you do for physics and chemistry and so on. It's a deep discipline with a long history. Now, I'm not necessarily going to defend those theological depths, 
because I think ultimately they are mistaken. But you don't reach them, you don't critique them by criticising the top levels, the superficial levels of theology. And that's why I think sometimes when I see a scientist critiquing religion, I cringe because they're not, they don't understand what's deep underneath this. They don't understand what I would call real theology, what's going on in that area of academic discipline. They just understand the, the trimmings at the top. Fair enough, critique those trimmings. And if you have the expertise, by all means, critique the deeper levels of this as well. But most physicists, biologists, whatever, who do this don't have that capacity, I think. Hence, I'm never quite myself convinced by their arguments, even though I think I can offer other arguments that would, in fact, critique theology at its depth. But I don't think the physicists would necessarily understand what I was saying either. Any more than I understand what they're saying when they talk about quantum physics. Does this mean we should all stay safely within our own disciplines, with a nice fence around us? Well, clearly, no. There has to be some interdisciplinary exchange. That's how human knowledge advances. If we build these fences around us and stay in our little tiny, tiny enclosures, we're not really going to get very far. And that's why scientists reach out and try to communicate their ideas to a popular audience. And it's why there is dialogue and criticism between different disciplines. But I think you have to acknowledge that if you're working from within one particular discipline, you're not going to be as familiar with the other person's discipline as they are, and nor are they going to be as familiar with your area of expertise as you are. And I think it's very important to acknowledge to yourself when you're stepping out of your area of expertise. Now, I am not a quantum physicist. I am not a cosmologist. I do not pretend to even begin to understand the complexities of those theories. But I would suggest that the same is true of scientists who critique religion, that they don't even begin to understand the complexity of some of the ideas that underline the academic discipline of theology and or philosophy, not, as I say, these surface ideas. So when a scientist is talking theology or philosophy, I actually feel competent to critique them because I am actually trained in those disciplines. I'm also trained in biology, but I'm not trained in physics, but I am trained in biology. I do understand something of science, but not specifically physics, for example. But when they begin to speak philosophy and even critiquing theology, I do think that I'm in a position to critique them. And I think they ought to be forthcoming about their limitations. When a philosopher talks science, take what they say about science with something of a pinch of salt. And when a scientist begins to talk philosophy, take what they're saying with something like a pinch of salt. Not that they can't be saying important things, not that a scientist can't also be a philosopher, but if they spent their entire life studying string theory or wormholes, they're unlikely to have the same understanding of philosophy that they have of that. They're even unlikely to have the same understanding of relativity theory as they have of that. So let's always be aware of our own limitations in terms of our knowledge. Let's be aware also conscious of the limitations of others when they're stepping out of their area of expertise.